Thank you for being here. That's all right. Uh, tell us, Hayden, uh, where have you come from in um, terms of today, anyway? Same place as beyond Egypt, so around Carlingford. Carlingford's where all the action happens. Is it? Okay, <laughs> right. Um, and uh, you've uh, got a family? Tell us yeah, so it. I'm married to um, a, a Korean. We've been married now for about seven years, um, no, al almost eight years. And we've got two daughters, um, a six year old and a four year old. Excellent. And you just actually spent some time in Korea based on your yeah, Facebook right. feed. What, yeah. what was the, uh, the plan there? Oh, the plan was to, uh, yeah, to go on a holiday um, and attend a, a family member's um, wedding, but uh, also God um, opened up some doors for me to share my testimony and speak in Korea where people are really responsive um, to my testimony. So right. that was really encouraging. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and where's church for you guys, your, you and your family? Uh, we're at church in Epping. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Okay, well, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Yeah, and, sure. um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's nice to meet you all. Um, also, just uh, just to fill you in, um, I'm a Baptist. Please forgive me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, so I became a Christian in the Sydney Anglican Church, um, and uh, now going to Morling Baptist College. And I'm just in my last semester of my BTH, and I'm just about to do accreditation studies for the, the Baptist Union. Um, but uh, yeah, I became. Um, uh, as, as you might might have worked out already, I um I've been struggling with same sex attraction uh, in my own in my own life, um, and what I'm going to do I'm about to share with you a testimony like um, about how I um, how God has dealt with me with this issue, um, and then we're going to look at uh, a number of things which you've got on your outline about what the culture says about sexuality and why it believes those things. And it's really important to know why people believe those things, not just what they believe. Um, secondly, it's going to look at, we're going to look at what, um, what science says about sexuality, um, as if science is a person with a voice, uh, and then what the Bible says, and then look at, just have some pastoral reflections about um, how to deal with those kinds of things. Um, I, um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in a, in a, um, in a place where there's a um, nominal Christianity. Uh, so, I, you know, my dad was Church of England. Uh, he didn't even call it Anglican, it was Church of England. Um, and my mum was a Catholic. I was baptised a Catholic. Uh, but really, they were just kind of like loose symbols, you know, that were part of the Christian morality thing. Um, and I went to church schools. Um, I grew up on the North Shore. Um, and so we, you know, we went to um, school, um, you know, growing up in North Shore. Um, and the North Shore, um, if you're not familiar with that part of the part of the world, um, is a kind of a funny place. Like, as you might have guessed, it's very segregated. Um, you know, people think that Eastwood is the western suburbs. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they think that crossing the Harbour Bridge is something you just never do unless you're going to Wynyard to work. Uh, uh, and even though you know there are other places in Sydney that are kind of like it, like you know, the Shire and, you know, um, Castle Hill and all those places, they kind of think that, you know, that's just too far west. Uh, you know, you go to Chatswood and everyone's got a collared shirt, and if you're not, well, they'll find you in the parking lot. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a place of, like, you know, very conservative, very conformist, very, you know, um, you know, people in the North Shore, we're rich, we've got lots of money, that's why we don't have problems like divorce and everything like that. Um, and, you know, it's, it is kind of funny, uh, but it is actually often how people think. Um, the North Shore is a place where people often think that having lots of good things kind of um, earns away your problems. Uh, and I kind of grew up in, in that environment and, um, you know, I didn't see much of the rest of Sydney. I mean, the, West, the Western suburbs were a real mystery. Uh, now it's not. Um, <laughs> In fact, I've spent uh, when I was working at Liberty Christian Ministries. I actually spent most of my preaching time. About 80% of my preaching time was in the western suburbs, um, which says to me there's a big need here. Uh, but I grew up in, the, in this environment where, um, you know, my dad was a very hard, hard-working person. Um, you know, he had um, had a big job uh, that would often take him away, and so I was. I went to these nice, expensive schools, had expensive toys, had a good education, a really good education. Um, but it was almost as if um, doing that my dad thought that he would give me the best of everything that by giving me the best of everything uh, and buying all this nice expensive stuff that that would somehow be a substitute for having a relationship with him so often even though I had all this good stuff I didn't actually see much of my father very much uh, and I know that um, that came from his own brokenness that came from his own kind of the way that he'd grown up uh, he didn't have those nice wonderful things and so he thought that by giving me those things that that would kind of be a substitute what I found was growing up was that I needed him more and more, but he was around less and less. 
Uh, and being a person who has to work you know, long hours to make a good income to pay for all those things, live in a three-story house, have two, you know, um, two expensive cars, doing that kind of means you've got to work all the time and the more you work, the more, you know, the more pressure there is, the more grumpy you are when you come home because you bring home work, you know, you bring home, um, bring work home. So often I found that that was what, what my relationship with my dad was like. Uh, and in the, when I was kind of growing up, that didn't have much of an impact, uh, but I noticed that as I got older, that kind of separation between my father and I got quite, quite big. My dad and my, my mum grew up in the 1950s and 1960s, and that was an era where, you know, um, some people here seem to be born in that era. And it was an era where, you know, it's stiff up the lip. No, no, no slide on anyone born in that age. It's, just, it's, not, it's not your fault, you didn't choose it. Um, <laughs> I didn't choose mine. Um, but you know, that was an era where it was, you know, um, very British, very stiff upper lip, you know, we don't show emotions, especially men. Um, you know, if you do, if you do show emotion, uh, you know, you kind of do it really in private. And I really noticed this when my mother died when I was 21, you know, my father, wore, my, my dad wore sunglasses to, to the funeral and, you know, would not show emotion. So that, that was kind of what, what I was very familiar with, very stoic, very, you know, um, got to work hard, come home, and dad often wouldn't even talk because he'd be so stressed from work, you know, turn on the TV, don't talk to me kind of thing. And so growing up like that, after a while, I started to feel this kind of separation from him and I thought maybe it's my fault, maybe he doesn't love me, maybe I've done something to kind of mean that he doesn't want to be around me. So that kind of separation got, got a little bit stronger and stronger and then when I was in high school, when I started high school, I noticed that I um, had same-sex attraction. Uh, and it wasn't like I kind of woke up one day and thought, of all the things I'd love to be in my life, I'd love to be gay. Uh, you know, I could be an astronaut, I could be a politician, um, you know, why not be gay? Um, it kind of wasn't like that. Uh, it was almost like when I was about 12, I started, um, you know, I was, at, I was at an all boys school um, and I noticed that I was attracted to other guys at school. And it was this kind of sinking realization that, oh my gosh, I've got this issue. And almost every guy I've spoken to who's got same-sex attraction, and, it, and, and, other, and women as well, have often said that they've experienced the same thing. It's not like they woke up and decided to be same-sex attracted, contrary to what their parents have assumed. It's like, it, it, it's, it's more of a realisation. Uh, and that's an important difference to, uh, to note because sometimes when people hear, especially when they hear that their son or their daughter is gay, the parents blame themselves and they, and they assume all sorts of things like, why is he choosing to be like this? Or why is she going to be like that? And it's like, well, they're not actually choosing to be like that. And in fact, every person I've met who has same-sex attraction would do anything and everything to get rid of it. Uh, even people who defiantly call themselves gay and love that, that, that identity, uh, almost all of them would say that if they had a choice between the red pill and the blue pill, like they say in the Matrix, to be gay or straight, they would not want to be gay. Uh, no gay person really wants to be gay. Uh, the choice that we have is what to do with it, which is another matter altogether, but we don't actually want to have that. But that's kind of what, what ended up happening. Um, and at the time I didn't know what caused it. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't know what to do about it. It was very confusing. So I spoke to the school counsellor and he said, OK, well, you know, um, I can't take the place of your parents. They should be the ones to guide you, so why don't you tell them? So I thought, OK, I'll tell them. Uh, and so I did tell them, and the reaction really wasn't bad. The Titanic sank slower than that. Yeah. Uh, this one sank pretty fast. Um, and my, my, my parents were so angry, um, especially my dad, was so angry that it was like, no son of mine is going to do that. You're going to bring shame on the family name. You know, um, I've, you know we've, built, we've made a name for ourselves. We've got an identity. You know, I work really hard. You know, the last thing I want my son to be is gay. Um, go get yourself a girlfriend. Do what you have to do to get rid of it. Um, but, you know, just don't be that because, you know, that's kind of worse than, than death itself. Uh, and so I thought, okay, well, I'll have to keep quiet about it, you know, say nothing. And I tried that for a couple of years and it really didn't work um, because it meant there was shame. The more shame I felt, the more uh, I pushed it down, didn't want to talk about it to anybody. And the difficulty was, at that time, this is, this is about 1993, 1994, at that time people weren't as pro-gay as they are now, but it was the kind of like when things were starting to get that way. And so all the voices I was hearing was, you're born that way, you're made that way because that's how you feel. And I thought, 
well that's kind of weird because we don't say that about anybody else with any other kind of condition but for this one it's you know you're just born that way because that's how you feel but that's often what I heard and I didn't really hear, hear many alternatives to that uh, and so um, even though I was going to a Christian school and spoke to a couple of Christian counsellors or um, you know counsellors at Christian schools I should say their perspectives were kind of very muddled um, you know it was like you're gonna have to embrace this you know be loud be proud you know that kind of stuff uh, so I followed that advice um, because for, for two years, having been told that I was, you know, um, I had to keep this quiet, couldn't tell anyone, I thought, I want to tell everyone because I'm tired of keeping it a sh dirty, shameful secret and someone had better know because, okay, I'll tell the world and maybe the world will hear and that might be bad in some ways, but it's better to tell everybody than to tell nobody because uh, I'm just sick and tired of dealing with this in isolation and for a 14-year-old kid to deal with something like that in isolation, uh, was really just too much. It was just, it was doing my head in. I mean, it's hard enough for an adult to deal with that without help, but for a 14 year old who keeps getting told by grown ups, um, don't talk about that, don't bring that here, uh, I was just like, I'm just getting sick of this. The grown ups don't know what they're talking about. Um, lunatics running the asylum. Uh, so uh, I just thought, okay, well, you know, that's what I'll do. Um, at, at my first high school, I actually went, went to two high schools. My first high school, I was often teased for being gay. Um, and that, that then started to create some conf more confusion for me because I thought, I haven't actually told anyone that I'm gay, but somehow everyone keeps calling me gay, sissy, fag, queer, all this sort of stuff, and so maybe it's true. Uh, and even though I later realized that that actually wasn't true, that that's not why they were calling me those names, it's actually started to feed this lie that, yeah, maybe I am, because the word stuck. They say sticks and stones will break my bones, but word will never harm me. That, this, that did quite the opposite. Words, words really have a power to them. So because the bullying got so bad, I actually left and went to another school. The next counsellor said, okay, be loud, be proud. I know this is a Christian school, but hint, hint, I don't really agree with what the school's doing. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> go, tell, go tell the universe. So I thought, okay, well, why not? Sick of, keep, sick, sick of keeping it a secret, so I went and told everybody. And this is a kind of a boys' school, like the, like the one in that movie, um, The Dead Poet Society. Um, didn't really go down very well, but uh, it did get a re it got an interesting reaction. Most of it was angry homophobic, and I kind of knew that was going to happen. Uh, but it was interesting because this is the first time I'd ever come across real Christians. Uh, so there are a few um, a few people in my year, um, including a, a son of an archbishop, um, who actually witnessed to me in a really loving way, and it, was, it totally threw me off because I thought there was going to be a bunch of homophobic rat bags. Um, some of them were, but um, some of them actually said to me, you know, God doesn't actually like what you want to do with your life. He doesn't want you to live that, that, that kind of gay life, but he does have a good plan for you and he does love you. And I thought, you know, it's kind of like, like, what, like what Dan and Paul Grimman were saying, that I had kind of believed this lie that I was made this way and that if I was born this way and made this way, that therefore no one could criticize me because that's criticizing who I am. Um, and so therefore, if someone criticized that part of my life, they were criticizing me. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in greater depth when I when I talk when I go through this. Um, but that was a really um, that really challenged me. One way that I think that wasn't expressed very well was when people said something like "God hates the sin but loves the sinner." The reason that that's problematic is because to me it wasn't a sin. This is something that's really important for you to understand when we're going through this, is that so often when we talk about homosexuality, especially to people who are living that lifestyle, or even some Christian people who've accepted this as part of their identity, when you say God hates the sin but loves the sinner, one, it wasn't actually said by Jesus, it was said by Gandhi. Second, uh, the love of God is much more complex than that. If you read that book by John Carson, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God, he actually knocks this, this cliche on the head, and it really is a cliche. It's true in so many ways, and it's wrong in so many others. And especially on this, I thought, this is not a sin. Because to me, it's an identity, it's who I am. I later realized it wasn't, but that one really didn't help. I think a better way of saying it was, God actually does love you, like he loves everybody else, and like everybody else, he accepts them even though he doesn't accept every part of their life. And he actually wants to change you, not because he wants to rob you of joy, but because he wants to give you himself as your joy. Once it was said to me like that, it made a lot more sense. Because then it wasn't God saying, I don't like homosexuality in your life, or, you know, I want to take that away from you. 
It's about, I love you and I therefore don't want you to live a certain way. Whether that's in same-sex attraction or in any other aspect of life, being angry, cursing people, gossiping, stealing, lying, you name it. Um, and I'll actually take you to a, a verse a little bit later in Corinthians that kind of actually says exactly the same thing. Uh, so that was really mind-blowing for me. I just thought, wow, you know, th there's, there's something more to Christianity than, than, than I had first suspected. So I actually became interested. I became a Christian in my final year of high school. And um, then I thought, okay, this is great. Um, you know, I now become a Christian. God will take all, away all the struggles. You know, two, four, six, eight. Come on, God, make me straight. Help <laughs> Help me now to procreate, um, and you know I thought, okay, whiz bang, you know God, God, God will just take it all away. He'll make it easy, straight narrow path. You know, I got bummed when I got to Matthew's Gospel and read, you know, broad is the way to destruction, narrow and difficult is the way to eternal life. You didn't get that one. Um, I got it a lot later. Um, but that part, well, I, I thought God, you know, if you're good, you'll take it away, won't you? You'll make it easy for me. Um, and it didn't happen like that, uh, and I was quite disappointed. Um, but I thought, okay, well, maybe God is going to do something else with this. Um, so I kept, you know, being Christian. But that year, my final year of, of high school, when I became a Christian, I also went to Mardi Gras. Um, you know, it was a thing that no North Shore kid was ever supposed to do. Uh, you know, you know, you shouldn't do that. Um, but I, I went because I wanted to see what it, what, what it was all about. I, and I heard all this thing about it. And at that time, they used to televise it on Channel 10, I think. So I thought, go see what it's like. I got there and I thought it was going to be gay, um, you know, in the traditional definition of that word. Uh, and it was very, it was interesting because i just become a Christian, but I definitely sensed something quite demonic about it. Um, it was blasphemous, it was loud and, and proud, it was full of pride. And that in itself, um, God showed to me quite vividly, was a big problem. Um, that God's judgment was upon this and this was not a way to live. And I was quite shocked at the things that I saw because... I didn't see, you know, um, uh, people had told me, you know, gay men, lesbian men can be faithful like heterosexuals. I didn't see that um, at Mardi Gras. I saw people using one another. Um, and so it was, I was like, okay, um, you know, I think that being a Christian is definitely a, a, a good thing to do. It's interesting how God had used that actually to confirm my commitment to him. Uh, and I went away um, and I w went to church. I went to various ch um, um, churches. Um, and the Anglican churches that I went to, some of the pastors there really knew very well how to deal pastorally with these things. Um, and uh, some of them really didn't. Um, the ones who didn't tend to be, tended to be the majority, which was quite um, frustrating actually because I knew that they, they often wanted to help. Uh, but very often the assumption was just read more Bible, just have more church, just hear another sermon, just do another church activity or we'll give you a leadership position or something like that and I knew the intention deep down was probably a good intention but I found it actually was just a kind of a way of saying we don't want to deal with this uh, and they never said that but I could see it um, you know um, and other people kind of freaked out about it and some people actually said you know you should, probably shouldn't talk about that kind of stuff and I thought well, where else can I go with it What's the point of being a Christian if I can't even take that aspect of my life? And not just that aspect, but there are other things, you know. Um, or if you're angry, don't take that to church. Uh, and don't take that to church. I thought, well, if I can't take it to church, can I take it to God? Uh, who can I take these things to? Oh, well, um, we've got a list of professional counsellors. I'm like, what, I have to, I have to see a counsellor to talk about this stuff, not, not anybody else? People can't pray for me. People can't... You know, we can't meet halfway on this. And they're like, oh, no, 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 well, I'm not a professional counsellor. I've never studied counselling. I don't know how to deal with those problems. And I thought, well, gee, I haven't studied a counselling degree either, but it doesn't mean I can't help you with your problems. You know, I don't know what it's like to have a schizophrenic daughter. Does that mean I, I can't help you in that? I can't pray for you. I can't sit with you. I can't have fellowship with you just because I don't understand. Like, I, I couldn't understand the thinking. And it, I, over a while, it started to frustrate me to the point where I just thought, what's the point going to church? Um, I really, really, really struggled with that. And so um, it was not long after this that um, my mother found out that she had cancer. She had three months to live. She had the gospel with us. She became a Christian and then she died. And then after that, things really got kind of even worse. Um, my family kind of Went, kind of went in their own direction. I went to church, told them about all the stuff I was struggling with, and said, well, we can't help you with grief either. Mm. I thought, what can you help me with? Um, just read the Bible. Oh, 
So it was getting really, really hard and I thought, well, you know what, my, my earthly family kind of are all over the place, my spiritual family is a bit all over the place, so you know what, who cares if I go and sleep around and do what I like. Um, and when I was about 21, I started sleeping around for the first time. Um, it was my kind of introduction to the gay world. Uh, and it was a very, um, very kind of against what I was expecting. Um, I had a few gay friends and they said to me, you know, you can, you know, do what you like, there are no limits, you know, you can go do what, whatever you want. Isn't that fun? Isn't that wild? Yes, it was wild. Um, but, you know, like I was having sex with strangers. Um, I was having, like, initially when I was doing this, um, it would kind of be like, you know, once every six months, but I noticed I became more and more addicted to it. Uh, it over time, it kind of got worse and worse. And I was putting myself in very risky situations. Um, the things I was doing with myself were getting riskier and riskier. Uh, and that's kind of a part of, the, part of the cut and thrust of the gay life, is that you're doing riskier and riskier stuff with yourself. You're pushing the boundaries, as they call it. Um, and, you know, but that also meant having to go to sex, clini sex health clinics and having blood tests every, done every three months to make sure I haven't got something. Uh, so that was really, um, really opposite to what I was expecting. And I kept being told, you know, one day you'll find someone, one day you'll find someone. And these were people who'd been in the gay life for about, oh, I don't know, five, ten years, some, some of them longer. And I said to them, what, have you ever found the one? Oh, no. Uh, have you ever come close? Mm, no. Oh, really? And one guy I, met, I knew actually said to me, he'd been living with his boyfriend for about 10, 15 years. And I said to him, well, it looks like, you know, you found the one because you finally found someone that you can be long term with. And in the gay community, if your relationship lasts longer than six months, you're doing extremely well. And he's like, oh, but yeah, he's, he's, he's not the one. I said, what, you've been living with him for 15 months. You actually bought a house together and you're renovating it together. Oh, yes, but, you know, we have what we call an open relationship. I said, what's that? Oh, it's where we get to sleep around with other people on the side. Really? He said, yeah, that's quite common in the gay community. It's kind of like, you, you've kind of got two things. You've got, you've got an open relationship where you know that your partner, you, you and your partner actually have an agreement to continue sleeping around with other people. Or you have what's called a closed relationship where you assume your partner isn't sleeping around, but you still are. But they still are. Or you are, but your partner just doesn't know it. And you better hope he doesn't find out because there's going to be trouble. And I was really, really shocked about this uh, because I, I was like, well, that's not good press. And they're like, yeah, but we all know it. And uh, there were some people who, who were going into the gay community going, oh, we, you know, we don't like that promiscuous stuff, you know. But that's like saying, I don't want to see planes at airports. Like, uh, it's, just, it's just the nature of the beast, really. Um, and so I, over a while, I, I became quite disillusioned with it. And, uh, you know, um, I wanted to come out of it. And, but coming out of the gay community wasn't easy because it meant going back to church. And that was the place that kind of helped me go in there in the first place because of the, rea the way that they reacted to me. So I thought, well, going back to church, this isn't going to be easy. But I thought, you know, see how we go. And that was a difficult time because when I went back, um, you know, I was, I was trying, trying to learn to trust people again. And I kept occasionally acting out. Um, and every now and then people would come up to me and offer me advice like, oh, you know, it's absolutely terrible that you've acted out again. Um, you know, been sleeping around again. It's really not good for you. Um, you know, haven't you read the Bible? Don't you know it's wrong? I went, yes. I know it's wrong. I know why it's wrong. I could tell you in my sleep how it's wrong. Um, but I need a bit more than Bible. And they said, oh, well, just go to God for forgiveness. You know, go to, go to the throne of grace and ask for forgiveness and he'll dispense forgiveness and whatnot. And so, you know, I'd sleep around, ask forgiveness, sleep around, ask forgiveness. And I, after a while, I thought, this isn't really changing me. It's not changing me because I'm not facing any consequences for it. I mean, I read Corinthians and there were horrible consequences if you read chapter 5, my goodness, the consequences for continuing in sexual sin while being a Christian are pretty terrible. Paul uses the language of the Old Testament and says, kick the person out of the camp. No pun intended. Um, kick, pick, kick the person out of the camp and, you know, tell them to separate from the community and bind that man over to Satan. That's Paul's language. Cast that man over to the devil himself, that the devil may teach him how to stop sinning. No, it doesn't get it doesn't get stronger than that. In Hebrews, you know, don't mess around with your with your inheritance of grace and be like Esau, who sold his birthright for a bowl of soup to be sexually immoral, and you know, go you know, give up your inheritance in the Lord, and which you can never bargain back, even if you've got all the tears in the world for it. So the language of the New Testament was really strong.
There are other places as well where this, where, the, where this comes out. And so I thought, but my church experiences tell me, oh, just ask God for easy forgiveness. And the other is, well, if you keep doing this, you have to be bound over to Satan. So what is it? Eventually a pastor rebuked me in very Pauline language and he said to me, look, you're going to have to stop doing this. You're going to have to stop sleeping around or otherwise we'll have to stand you in front of the whole congregation and we'll kick you out. And he was serious. The meeting we had was about 30 minutes and it felt like 300 hours. Like it was slow and agonizing. I was so angry with him. I didn't talk to him for about six months. Um, but I knew and Every bit of me was like, that is so judgmental and I've got chapter and verse from the Bible that says you can't do that and I had them and twisted bits of scripture to say, to justify my position but I, in the end, the spirit convicted me and said, no, you better stop. Like, this is, like what he's saying is absolutely right, you have to stop. And so very, very slowly, it took, it took six months, I'm you know, coming around and saying, okay, I've really got to be serious about this. So I went to Liberty, um, I, uh, to Liberty Christian Ministries and joined a support group and, and other things. Um, and uh, after a while, um, you know, God, um, God started working me. He introduced me to my, to my wife. She's the first person I ever, uh, first woman that I ever had, a, had any relationship with. Uh, but God put it very quickly on our, on our hearts. Um, it's a long story how we met. Um, but he put it very, very strongly on our hearts to, to be married to one another. And he gave us word, like, he just kept, kept sending us messages saying, you know, get married, do this because I'll be with you and I'll bless your marriage and work through you. Um, so that was an interesting time. We got married. Part of my part of my motives for getting married were, were, were quite mixed. Um, you know, of course, I was saying I was doing it for the glory of God. Other parts of me were actually trying to hide the fact that I hadn't actually dealt properly with my homosexuality. I thought that getting married would kind of, you know, make it get better. Like a lot of people think, oh, you know, I'll get married and I'll stop lusting after I get married. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what God says. Um, yeah, like, I, yeah. Um, and yeah, finding out that after getting married and, you know, um, after consummating a marriage and whatever, that actually you didn't take it away, that actually there was more work to be done, which I'll get on to later. Um, but, you know, that was, that was, but at the same time, God also used my marriage to actually, like, control me, help me to work through the issues underneath my same-sex attraction. So in, in a lot of ways, he's actually used my marriage and my family um, to actually really help me with this. Um, now that's not to say that people should get married to, um, you know, to kind of realise God's healing work in their life, but um, that's what God did with me, and um, it's really interesting how God's been uh, using that. As I've become a father, I can see how he's a father. As I've become a husband, I can see how God is a faithful husband, um, and, you know, learning patience. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, I, I led um, a ministry called Liberty Christian Ministries for two years. And um, I've um, shared my testimony um, a few times in Korea, um, and it, which is quite interesting. Um, you think that Asian people are very conservative and don't want to hear about that stuff, um, but they do. They're, they're really interested because um, Asian culture has a lot of this, has a lot of these issues. They just kind of sweep it under the rug, and they kind of like it when a, especially when a foreigner comes and talks about that. Um, for some reason, if another Korean talks about it, they kind of like don't really listen. But if a foreigner talks about it, oh wow! Um, so yeah, it's really encouraging. Um, so I'm now going to get on with my, with my presentation. Um, I don't know if you know this. Um, does anyone know that movie? No. Stephen King. Oh, it's The Shining, you know, hotel manager and his oh. trying to kill his family. Anyway, um, so sometimes people think that homosexuality is a big scary topic um, and there's a good reason for that. You know, our culture is becoming very hostile um, about Christianity and what it says about sexuality and relationships. Um, and so we kind of think it's this big scary thing. Um, really, it's, it's not a scary thing. I think more often it's just about how are people going to react? What are people going to say? Um, and that's a, I think in some ways that's a loving thing to think about. In other ways, um, I think it's important not to get too hung up about what other people are going to say about what God says because, you know, if we trust God and we trust how God works in a person's heart, then we're not going to be so worried about what other people are going to say um, because the world's never going to like what God says. Uh, whether it's about sex or whether it's about forgiveness or whether it's about anything else, the, the world's always going to, it's never going to get it. Uh, so 
I think it's important just to face that and say, you know, um, God's word is good, and God is good, and He always keeps His promises. Uh, so, you know, let's not be too worried about it. Um, so, yeah, we're going to just going to look at what does the world say uh, at the moment about sexuality. First thing that it says is almost any kind of sexual behaviour is okay. Uh, and no one should criticize anyone else for it unless it obviously causes hurt to others. Now, the kind of word that's a bit scary is that any kind of sexual behavior is okay. And recent commentary by certain psychologists in Australia and America and other places are even saying that some forms of pedophilia are okay. Even Richard Dawkins um, let that one slip about a year ago. Uh, so, yeah, you know, you peel back the curtain in one sense. You know, in the 1960s, it was about um, women's sexual freedom. Uh, now it's about same-sex attraction. It's like, what's behind the next curtain? Um, another, but no one should criticize unless it obviously hurts anyone. Um, that one's a big one because it's all about, this is my personal happiness as I define it, and so God's meant to just be a rubber stamp on my happiness. Because God is love, therefore love is God. Uh, so, unless it, hurt, unless it obviously hurts me, unless I'm getting AIDS or something, and even if I am, uh, don't criticize because you know I'm not hurting anyone. Um, there's a report, however, in the Sydney Morning Herald about two days ago that the incidences of AIDS um, and syphilis and gonorrhea is skyrocketing in Australia. Safe sex messages are not changing. Education does not change people. Shock. Horror. The AIDS campaigns of the 1980s, the 90s and now are not working and my conviction is that they never will because in the gay community, as I said, one of the things that you do is you do risks with yourself and with other people. And it does not obviously hurt anyone because he people's heads aren't popping off, but there's this really sad um, element to that, which I'm, I'm, I'll show later in some really shocking statistics that actually show that it is causing harm to others. There was a program on the ABC last year about a sex health clinic in Manchester where they basically look at um, people coming through their clinic who engage in risky sexual behaviour and a nurse after nurse said the same thing that homosexuality is the most risky form of, gay, of sex that any, that any person can do to themselves, especially men. Lesbian relationships are a little bit different in the sense that lesbian women can be together and couple and live together without actually having any physical intimacy with one another, like in a, in a very um, sexual sense. Um, so lesbianism is quite different um, and it's got its own problems um, that are a lot less tangible than gay relationships. Um, lesbian sexual problems tend to be more relational and the way that their relationships break up, they're extremely messy because they're so emotional. Whereas with men, they tend to be a lot more tangible in terms of the physical consequences on their own bodies. Um, but that's one of the big assumptions. Another one is that sexuality is innate and, in and immutable. It's dangerous to change people's sexuality. Of course, that only works one way. In the gay community, it's a big sexploit, if I can use that word, uh, if you can make a straight man gay, if you can get a straight man to kiss you and make him gay and give him a gay experience, oh, I made a straight man gay, isn't that cool? Uh, but if a gay man wants to be straight, oh, hell hath no fury. Uh, it's very one way. Uh, and of course, we don't say that about other people. Uh, you know, if, um, if, a, if, a, if, if a straight person wants to become gay, oh, that's fantastic. They've found out who they really are. Uh, but if, a, if it goes the other way, well, he's, he's in denial. This is silly use of psych psychological language, but that's often the assumption. Um, homosexual people are born that way and cannot be condemned for their behaviour, as I said. Gay people should be allowed to marry, adopt children and commend their lifestyle as perfectly valid in schools and other places of influence. And we're seeing that now. I, I gave this presentation about a year or two ago and people didn't believe me. Now, it's getting worse. Um, the New South Wales government, which you know, is conservative and is led by a Christian, has a proud schools program, which advocates homosexuality. If, you, if, you, if you're on Facebook and you get the link to Fred Niles, page, he puts up posts about what's going on and it's, it's pretty shocking. Even if you don't sympathise with the Christian Democratic Party or don't want to vote for them, it's just interesting to see his page because he posts up on Facebook what you see and, you know, it's quite, it's quite um, troubling what, what's there. Um, another one is that you can be gay and Christian. 
Uh, this is a really big one and it's a, I think it's one of the most problematic because you get people who take this to the extreme. And see, it's one thing to say, I'm gay and I'm not Christian, but God should rubber stamp my lifestyle. It's another thing to then say, I am a Christian, therefore God should never tell me I'm wrong. Other people should never hold me to account and I can have both worlds. In some ways, that's even more deceived because to be gay and Christian is to say, I'm Christian and that's my most important identity, but I'm going to have it with something else. I'm going to have it with a sin. And Jesus said, you cannot love God and money. You can't have it both ways. One, one, one identity will give in and it's usually God, unfortunately. Even calling yourself a gay Christian, you know, you're a gay Christian. Uh, you're not a Christian who's gay, you're a gay Christian. And if you think about that, that's their foremost identity. And they just use Christianity to, rub, to rubber stamp it. And they compromise themselves in other aspects of their life. But um, that's, that's a really big one. And it's a problem pastorally, I think. Especially because people think it's innate. Uh, and I'm going to um, put up some, some scientific findings that actually challenge that. But that's a, that's a big one. Um, evidence for the born gay theory is very thin. Um, if you go to mygenes.co, it's written by a Christian scientist who actually, um, a Christian biologist who's written a lot on this. But you got some um, genetic studies where they looked at twins. They looked at twin, um, twin babies of the same gender. Now twins, if anyone, if there is some kind of innate um, truth about homosexuality, you'll find them in twins because they share the same DNA pretty much. So if one twin is gay, the other one must be gay. Depending on which study you look at, most of the time, in most studies, that's actually not the case. The famous um, African-American basketball player who came out as gay about two years ago, forget his name, and he's a twin brother who's heterosexual. Most of the time, that's, that's, the, that's the case. And that shows that there is, some, there is probably some, something genetic going on or something biological, but it is not innate. And a number of gay scientists, like pro-gay scientists, have actually um, said this themselves. Some uh, other research is neurological. So there's a man called Simon LeVay. You can look him up on Wikipedia. He came out in 1993 and did some rather gritty research. I hate to do it myself. Where he looked at the brains of, of, of dead people. He looked at the gay brain and he looked at the brains of dead heterosexuals. He himself wasn't very objective in his study because he had just lost his partner and he wanted to go out and prove that homosexuality was innate. So he wasn't objective himself, but he did his, he did his research. Uh, and what he found, there was a part of the gay brain called INAH3 and, and a few other places. And this research was published and it came out with what they called um, the queer theory of, um, you know, the um, gay DNA, the gay brain, queer DNA and all this sort of stuff. So you heard about everyone raving on about this. Now Simon LeVay made a very interesting comment not long after his research was published where he said, you cannot say that people are born gay based on my research because the brain is elastic. Or plastic or whatever. Um, like, it's kind of like, like, like plasticine. Even though we're born with certain uh, proclivities, we can choose if we want to to work against our natural inclinations. The alcoholic can learn to live without alcohol. Even if he has a desire to drink, he can learn to live without alcohol. Uh, so, and there's actually been a lot of research published in the last 10 years on it, um, even after he said this, um, by um, uh, the brain that changes itself, I think it's called, uh, and other research. Um, uh, the brain that changes itself, you can actually find in most mainstream bookstores. Um, but that one actually says that people can do this. Even people with dementia, who've suffered strokes, who've lost brain capacity for, for language, can actually learn again. Um, and if you think about it, the gay community agrees with that language. They, they're always talking about how they want freedom and, you know, throwing off the shackles of other people's imprisonment and all this sort of stuff. And yet, when they believe, when they talk to themselves about their sexuality, they say, we're born that way, can't change. Now, I find remarkable that you'd think that if you think you've got so much freedom. But even he said that. Now that hasn't stopped people quoting his research as being the, the gay gene. And if you noticed uh, Philip Jensen's, um, Peter Jensen's um, appearance on Q&A about two years ago, that's the language that was thrown at him. What about the gay brain? Um, I actually sent this link to him not long after that just to say, heads up, it's a, it's a falsehood. Um, even the man who did the research himself says it's not true. There's another man called Alfred Kinsey. Um, who you might have heard of. Um, 
There's a movie about him with Liam Neeson, and uh, he came up with the figure of 10%. 10% of the world is gay, and you hear this all the time. Kinsey himself was a very compromised person. He used to have um, swingers orgies with his wife. Um, and uh, he did his gay research on prison populations. He used his sample, his sampling base came from prison populations and other places where there's a high frequency of homosexuality. Now prisons are well known for their situational homosexuality which is not that people are necessarily born gay or want to act out that way, it's just that there's no women around so they do, so they use whoever's in front of them. But he included that in his research and said came up with this 10% figure. Now at the moment there's an institute called the Alfred Kinsey Institute I think on sexual research and they have actually said don't use his research, don't even use Kinsey's research to justify homosexuality because he's so compromised. Um, again, that doesn't stop people from using the figure but most surveys put uh, the instance of homosexuality about 2 or 3%. 3% among men, about 1% among women. Uh, so on average about 2%. Um, Others have done chromosomal and hormonal studies. Um, you know, um, if, a, if, a, if a human baby, a human fetus has got, and it's a male and it's got too much estrogen, mum eats too much chicken, is son going to turn out gay? Again, it's inconclusive. So a lot of it is inconclusive. Um, there has been no one who's actually shown an objective link between homosexuality and any kind of innate condition. Um, other things? Evidence for homosexuality is more that it's psychological and environmental so there is some kind of um, genetic proclivity but it's not definitive it's not like you're just going to turn out like that um, just because you happen to like to eat McDonald's doesn't mean you're going to become obese you're only obese if you keep eating it um, but you still got control over your choices and your actions um, so it's Roughly about 10% nature, 90% nurture. Now, others might debate those, those figures, um, but it's still, I would still say, even if you disagree with me on the actual figures, it's like, we still have choice about what to do with your life. Um, and we, we, we say that about anybody else. If a person's born in India, in the, in, the, in the poverty end of the caste system, we don't say to them, oh, you should stay like that because you're born that way. We would, we would fight for them to climb up the income ladder. If a person is born, for example, uh, with a proclivity to take drugs because his mum happened to be a heroin addict, we wouldn't tell him, oh, go live like that and go do that because, well, you were just born that way, you know, suck it up. Um, you know, we'd help them to find new choices. So it's the same thing with same-sex attraction. Uh, most people um, can experience a change of orientation. Um, some of the people who led the first Mardi Gras actually um, are now in same um, opposite sex marriage relationships. So it's not necessarily Christian people who can experience change. There's a study done called um, X Gays by Jones and Yarhouse, which actually was a longitudinal study of people who chose to come out of homosexuality through um, like religious um, programs. And they actually found that most people do experience some kind of change. Now whether that's um, change as in they don't want to do it anymore or whether they still have the inclination but they choose not to act on it, most people, even if they give up after some time, will experience some kind of change. Which says that we have, as mo we have more control over our desires than we actually realise. In terms of the lifestyle risk, um, as I said, evidence shows that gay sex is more dangerous than other forms of deviant sex. Um, it can also have mental, physical and emotional uh, repercussions. Um, there's a, quite an interesting um, book called um, Pure Sex, which is written by Tony Payne and published by Matthias Media. There's an appendix at the back which quotes some figures comparing homosexuality to alcoholism. They found that people um, in the, with same-sex, well, actively gay people, I should say, um, had about the same health risks as alcoholics. Um, their average life expectancy was about 40. Um, about three years ago, the Australian Bureau of Statistics did the, la did the last census, and they actually put out a special profile on same-sex couples. And it's very interesting readings because the graphs show the same thing that the Pure Sex book showed. The number of people reporting to be actively gay, um, between about 25 and 35 peaked, and then about 40 significantly drops. From 40 to about 60 it gets less and less, and over 80 is minuscule. Um, in terms of the longevity of relationships, basically gay people do not live in long-term relationships, and a lot of the ones that do survive for a long time are usually open relationships where they're having sex with other partners. It's one of the big open secrets of the gay community that mon monogamous gay relationships um, just kind of don't exist. Uh, 
Um, they're not monogamous in the sense of being monogamous like the heterosexual community, though they would like to say it is, and they, that's why they often compare the two. But when you scratch beneath the surface, um, it's almost non-existent. And the ABS has actually demonstrated that, which you can actually find it on their website. Um, the Centers for Disease Control in America in 2010 wrote a detailed report about homosexuality. Um, a lot of the figures have now been taken off that website, which I think is because of public pressure. But they found that the <coughs> HIV diagnoses among men having sex with men is more than 44 times that of other men and more than 40 times that of women. So if you're a man who has sex with another man, you are 44 times more likely to get AIDS than um, a man who's not doing that. Um, the rate of secondary and primary syphilis among men having sex with men is more than 46 times that of other men and more than 71 times that of women. Um, it's really staggering that, um, as I said, these findings have since been taken off their website. Um, but only two days ago, there was another report done in the Sydney Morning Herald that basically shows this and the instance of AIDS is skyrocketing in Australia. You know, I think in last year there was 1,200 extra cases of it which is just you know, quite, quite large. Um, so there's a, there's a link down there. If you don't get the whole thing, it says facts about youth, but you can find this research in other places. In terms of the Bible, um, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that God, God has made us male and female, and that that's the proper and the only place for expression of sexuality is between a man and a woman in a marriage. Um, not a man and a man, a, a woman, a woman, a man with a dog, you know. Um, they say that a dog is a man's best friend. Uh, really? You should get married and have a wife. Uh, so, you know, God made male and female. Um, that's where marriage is to be expressed. And even though we don't like that, and oh, it's a limitation, and you know, it's how God made us. Um, you don't put sand in a petrol tank in a car. The car's not built for that. Um, and so it's the same thing. Uh, I think Genesis 1 to 2 is a great place to start because often people um, do things like they'll, they'll, they might look at the law in Leviticus or they might look at Romans 1 where it talks about the perversion of mankind into homosexuality. I often think that's actually not a very good place to start uh, because, um, I'm not, and I'm not criticizing the Bible writers, but um, Genesis 1 to 2 is where God made us. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of the beginnings. That's why the book is called Beginnings in Hebrew. Um, it's where God made us. Uh, and so I think, if, and I've, I've noticed that a lot of people can't argue this, um, even gay Christians where, where they say to me, oh, you know, um, God has blessed me in my sexuality. He's made me as I am, and that's his blessing to me. I say, well, what about Genesis? And they never want to argue it because they can't because it challenges the consistency of their, or the inconsistency of their worldview. Um, so that, I think that's a good place to start. Um, Jesus endorses that teaching. Uh, if you go to Matthew 19, we won't go there now, um, but he's got this, de this debate with the Pharisees about divorce. Uh, and he actually says that, well, God has made mankind as one flesh between a man and a woman. He actually quotes Genesis 2 word for word. So when people say, oh, Jesus never spoke against homosexuality, that's an argument from silence, which is pretty dodgy. Um, Jesus didn't talk about a lot of things. He didn't talk about using pot. He didn't talk about child sexual abuse explicitly. He didn't talk about a lot of things, but just because he was silent on them doesn't mean he endorsed them. And if he had endorsed homosexuality as a first century rabbi, he would have been killed before he was supposed to be killed. Uh, and, you know, um, there were other consequences he would have faced. So to say Jesus was pro-gay is just really bad. I mean, they say, oh, well, you know, he, he loved the marginalised and, you know, he, he had dinner with prostitutes. I said, yes, but he didn't live with them and he didn't tell them to keep doing that. In fact, in John, he tells a adulterous woman to not do it again. In Matthew chapter 4, the woman at the well, he says to her, you know, I am your, I'm your true husband, I'm your true man, worship me. And then she leaves her life of sin and converts Samaria. So it's a bit hard to say that Jesus endorses homosexuality because here he actually upholds marriage. He also commands, he also commended um, singleness and chastity. Now, it's interesting that passage because it says that some people, um, you know, are eunuchs because they were born that way. And some gay rights advocates go, oh, oh, there, it's coded language in the Bible that some are, some are born that way. Um, no. They're eunuchs. They're people who have chosen to be chaste and single for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Um, so it's not saying that Jesus isn't saying that marriage is just the is just the cure to this. There are some people who choose to be chaste um, for the kingdom of God. 
Um, sin has distorted our sexuality and it's brought into human experience distorted um, sexual appetites and behaviours. Um, Leviticus 18 and 20 um, you know, have exhaustive lists on this and it's where you get the so-called clobber passages of the Bible, you know, um, don't you know that gay people are going to hell? Like um, Leviticus 18.22 there the focus of the commandments against homosexuality are on behavior, not the person. Now even though the person can attract the penalty of the law through stoning, it's actually the behavior that they do that's the focus of the wrath of God. And I think the reason for this is that um, in the Bible, when people commit sin, especially if it's something that they're doing for quite a consistent period is that it becomes part of their identity unless you actually renounce what you're doing and you renounce your sin and you choose a new direction you're actually identified with your sin your sin attaches itself to you, who you are that's why I think the whole language of hate the sin but love the sinner is kind of kind of misses, really really misses that in a very profound way and it misses the significance of how angry God is at sin when we sin and you see this in the parable that Jesus t teaches in Luke 16 about the rich man in hell when you sin and you're judged, you are identified with your sin. Um, now having said that, well, I think the important thing in Leviticus is that God does love the person. And in the wider context of Leviticus, even though there's these laws against certain behaviours, the truth is God actually wants people to live in right relationship with him so he doesn't have to kill them. So he doesn't have to bring the weight of the law upon people. You know, to obey him from your heart. So. Um, it's an important dif distinction to make. Um, Paul views human history in this way in Romans 1. God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. He's there talking about people who are actively in homosexuality, not people, not Christians who are struggling with it. But what he shows is, the, the, in the context of that passage, he's actually showing that the human heart gives itself to something else that's not God. It's wandered away from God. It's now latched itself onto an idol. It worships created things rather than the Creator. So, you know, it worships the world and the earth. Maybe like the, like, like the Greens Party, you know, um, the things of this world. And it's because of their hearts. You notice it's their hearts that have been given, that have given over. Their heart, they gave their hearts over to something other than God, so He gives them over. And in that passage, there's about four or five, oh, three or four times where Paul continually says, and he gives them over, and he gives them over, and he gives them over, because they've first chosen to give themselves over for the degrading of their bodies. So the degrading of their bodies follows the choice of their hearts. And in God's passive judgment, um, he kind of gives them over to do what they choose. And so I think when people suffer consequences like STDs, AIDS, it's that. Not always. It's not to say that everyone who suffers AIDS and STDs is necessarily done that. If you look at kids in Africa who've been born to HIV positive parents, you can't say that. Um, but you live with your choices, unfortunately. Um, Jesus condemns lust and behaviour. Sometimes people go, oh, you know, in Leviticus, in Leviticus it only condemns the behavior, not the, not the desire. I actually think that the, um, the Bible's pretty emphatic in doing both. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 5, I'm reading the New King James, he says, put to death your members, in your members, anything of the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. So it's not just the behavior of doing it, it's actually the desire to do it. And in two, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11, there's a similar command, that's 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11, a similar command to kill lustful desire and not just the behaviour. Um, another one that really helped me in some very dark moments was actually Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to, 11 to 14. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching that uh, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, denying the lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our God and Saviour. So that's Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 12. And that's a really good one because it's like, yes, we can say no to the behaviour, but we say no to the behaviour because in our hearts, we're killing it by the power of the Spirit. Jesus also taught this, I uh, can't remember exactly where, where he actually says, where does fornication and evil and murder come from? It comes from the heart. So it's our hearts that need the surgery. 
That's why it's important for gay people who don't know Christ to have Jesus. Their problem is not their sexuality. The problem is they don't have Jesus. Once they give their heart to Jesus, then he'll deal with the bodies and the behaviours. If you try to deal with the sexuality first and then bring them to Jesus, they think that they've got to be right before God and they think they've got to fix themselves before they come to a relationship. And then they realise they can't do that because no one can fix themselves before they come to Christ. And then they give up and they don't want to know God. And that's why so many people in the gay community, I think, have rejected Christ because they think, I can't do it. Even if I want to, I can't. Um, Paul specifically identifies homosexuality in Romans 1. Um, you give yourself over to things that are not God. And I think the reason he does this, um, and I, don't, I've, I actually haven't seen many Bible commentators who pick up on this, the reason is that, see, God makes the world in Genesis, puts man in the garden and says, okay, look after the garden under me, and have a man and a woman. So first is God's relationship with his creator, and then man's relationship with his spouse. What happens when you reject God, what's the second thing that breaks down? The, the natural order between male and female. That's why he picks up on it, because it's not just about sex and sexuality and what you do with your bits and bobs. It's actually about when you, when you, give away from, when you move away from God, you're actually committing assault, not just on God, but on the created order and the normal running of human society, which actually breaks down human society. So gay, gay theology just says well, it's natural for me, and therefore that doesn't... Yeah, that's right. That's right. And actually, um, if you read the book of Judges, especially the last four chapters, where you see Israel repeating the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is just unthinkable, um, this is what happens. They give up on God, and they've given up on each other, and the whole country descends into a civil war. The almost, Israeli society almost wipes out. Um, which gives us food for thought for what's happening in our own culture. Um, uh, yeah. Homosexuality orientation is not condemned but what people do with it that's true but as I said it's, it's both the desire that when we come to God we love God his spirit works in our hearts we then desire new things now that might not necessarily mean that we're going to get married and necessarily have an intimate relationship with a member of the opposite sex by God's grace it hopefully will but doesn't necessarily mean that it's necessarily going to end out like that some people think because our world is so focused on love and sexual relationships oh poor you you're going to be like Bridget Jones you know Loser, miserable, lonely, and I, people, Christians who are single have to fight that a lot, and I, I really feel for them. So I'm not saying that people necessarily have to do what I've done and get married, um, and in fact God, God uses single people really well. Uh, two people come to my mind are Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, if he, wasn't, if he was married with a family he wouldn't have tried to kill Hitler. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been the witness that he was if he had a family. Um, Corrie ten Boom, who also survived the war and has had a very powerful ministry, had, had, used to have a powerful ministry, was a single woman. So it's not necessarily that you have to be married to have a powerful testimony. Um, and if God has given you singlehood, use it well. And 1 Corinthians 7 commends single, singlehood. This is a great verse. This one helped me become a Christian. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 10. Don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral, nor idolaters, adulterers, men who have sex with men, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanderers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Um, that means no one's going to heaven. If you're told a lie, you're going to hell. You know, if, you, if you've you know, lied, you're going to hell. Um, but in the next verse, in verse 11, it actually says, but that's what some of you were. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, such what, and such were some of you. That's what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So, 2,000 years ago, God was saving people out of homosexuality. It's really, really good news. Um, that verse, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, helped me become a Christian because I realized God's not homophobic. He hates the behavior and he hates desires that rebel against him, but he loves people to save them, give them new desires and give them you walk in life. <coughs> Homosexuality is not the worst of all sins. Um, another thing that's important to note is that um, in terms of the strong language of the Bible, like Paul, Hebrews, where it talks about people quenching the, quenching the spirit and giving up their inheritance, um, a lot of that language is talking about persisting in sin in a certain pattern of life. That if you're going to say, oh, um, God saved me and he's going to give me a new way, but you keep walking in the old way, you're only deceiving yourself. 
In almost every single New Testament epistle, there's warnings against Christians continuing in sin. And it, especially places like Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches, they all have warnings against churches about falling away. That it's not just sinning and indulging sin is not just a casual thing. If it's lifelong and it's a passion and a habit of life, it will cost you, it can cost you. Um, so, and I don't want to get kind of into a debate about, you know, once saved, always saved and all that sort of stuff. Um, but um, it's talking about persisting in a certain pattern of life. Um, that doesn't mean that God is not going to work in a person's life who is persisting in sin, but at some time you've got to wake up and smell the coffee. That's certainly the language of the New Testament. Um, and for me, that was the real turning point for me in my journey was when my pastor rebuked me. Um, other people have said, oh, what an unloving pastor, how judgmentally he shouldn't have done that. But I'm like, well, if he didn't do it, I wouldn't be married now. I wouldn't be in Bible college now. I wouldn't have a new walk in life. Um, Apostle goes on to talk about sexual morality is against uh, your own body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, so I think that's important. Um, it's, not, it's not just about what you do with your body. Uh, we, we, we live in a world that still thinks in very Gnostic terms, you know, spiritual is good, body's bad. So you either deny the body, which is very rare in our world, or you indulge every single craving you've got, whether it's Facebook, food or sex, um, or all, all three. Um, but our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's a, that's a great verse. 1 Corinthians 6.11, that's what some of you were. But you were washed, were sanctified, were justified. So, is God homophobic? Take that one out. You can, always, you can always take that passage out. It's a really good one. And this man called Cy Rogers, he used to live, lead a ministry. He, he actually came out of homosexuality, and the day he was going to become a woman, he became a Christian. It's amazing how God worked. He said to me, a minister once said to me, if you're so healed, why don't you look more manly? And I thought, my goodness, can't you be happy I'm not running around in a skirt anymore? Um, <laughs> So I put this one up because sometimes we think, okay, it's great, God loves people, he's not anti-gay, he can save and change gay people, uh, but is it all going to go away? Now if you hear Cy Rogers talking, he's, he's quite effeminate, like, um, he's actually a grandfather now, which is just, oh, I know, I can't ima really imagine Cy as a grandfather, um, and he's not the same as Cy who did the Gangnam Style video. Anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's quite a fet when he does his presentations and, you know, um, some, some people say that, you know, that's a sign that you're not healed, you haven't overcome. And what he's saying is, you know, we're going to have a, you know, perspective. We're going to have a healthy perspective on what change looks like. Uh, change can take a long time. Uh, if you're a heterosexual male, Here's a good comparison. If you're a heterosexual male and you're finding that your lust of women doesn't just stop because you're married or doesn't just stop because you have a relationship with God, then why would it for someone else? No matter what sin they're dealing with, uh, no matter kind of how hard it is or what category it's in, sin is sin. And sin has a really irritating way of sticking. It doesn't die quickly. And Satan doesn't want it to die quickly because it's how he gets his hook, hooks into you. Uh, so what he's saying is, you know, we've got to be patient with people. We've got to be prayerful. Um, and this is kind of where I'm leading into my next section. Um, this, this is just a picture of some old train tracks. Um, you know, this is a, I don't know where this is, but, um, you know, there used to be a train running down here and then they stopped using it. And you notice that the train tracks are still there, but it's all overgrown. Um, that those theories on brain plasticity are interesting because they actually use a similar analogy. Um, that if a person decides to change and if they're really serious about changing, then they can actually forge what they call new neurological pathways in the mind. Um, it's a bit like skiing on a, on a, on a, on a slope, on a, on a snowy mountain. If you just keep skiing down the same track, you kind of furrow a track into the snow. If you then decide to go on another side of the mountain to ski down, initially you're going to have a lot of problems because you're not going to have a groove. It's going to be hard, but if you keep persisting, you'll make a new track. That's basically how change works. Um, so it's not natural. In fact, a lot of the time you're working against yourself um, and it takes a lot of effort. You need accountability. You need a long-term strategy. You need to look after yourself. You need to do all sorts of things, but it's not impossible. It is very hard, but not impossible. In The Great Divorce, uh, C.S. Lewis tells an awesome story about a man who's got a lizard on his shoulder. 
this man's got an addiction and I think it's a euphemism for a sexual addiction or something else some kind of niggly persistent behavioral issue and this man um, comes across the ghost and I think the ghost is a, is, is a spirit from God and he has this encounter with the spirit I think this is the spirit here and he basically says okay give this thing up give it up give it up give up that, that lizard on the shoulder and the lizard keeps whispering in his ear it's kind of like a Satan figure and he says, oh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't give it up can't give it up like, why don't you come back later uh, why don't you talk about a different issue he keeps kind of palming it off and eventually um, he says and he says why don't you just take it off my shoulder just take it off just get rid of it what if you want it so much why don't you take it and the spirit says you've got to surrender it to me I can't just take it I can't override your will but you can surrender it to me he says oh but I don't want to die he said I said no one ever said you're gonna die it's gonna you might you might be scared that it's gonna be really painful it doesn't mean you're gonna die and it, but this man just holds on to it and then he finally screams out in a moment of agony says just take the thing take it get rid of it for me so the spirit takes it and it says that the man grew up and became something so powerful no one could no one could assault him um, and I think it's a really powerful image of what God can do in a person's life now does that mean that it necessarily is going to happen straight away does that mean it's going to happen in a flash of light and all of a sudden the person's going to have a Damascus Road experience and go oh my same-sex attraction has gone that has happened in the life of some people uh, there's a well-known Christian singer called Dennis Jernigan who had that experience but for most people it won't and there'll be varying um, responses to to this kind of issue but I think over time and I noticed this in my own life when I started to go to a counsellor and I started to work through a lot of the deep issues underneath my same-sex attraction anger history issues family past all sorts of things that over time my attractions have lessened uh, my the frequency of those attractions has lessened and so that lizard is coming off um, it's still there there's still temptation there's still um, you know things that I have to keep working with and I'm accountable to other people for but it is it is God's grace um, and I notice that the more times I choose not to indulge sin you know I'm on the computer there's a picture I could look at and in the back of my mind in the front of my mind I'm kind of going oh yeah it's only a picture you know that's not going to hurt and the back of my, and but the back of my mind the spirit saying uh, no you don't no you don't because you know that's not going to be good and I go okay I'll listen to you even though the other part of me doesn't want to uh, and I and I don't look at the picture I notice that God gives me extra grace to not give into it again um, and so it doesn't mean that once a person uh, you know loses a desire to do something that they can't go back to it again um, there have been a number of cases where people have actually gone back to things that they used to do uh, which is really sad um, but by God's grace it is possible and I think that's why it's important to have a, a, a counsellor a Christian counsellor that you can work through these things so it's not just being um, people aren't just doing it in the church necessarily uh, I mean church church is important you go to church to be part of a community to pray with people when you've got struggles but to expect your pastor or other people in the congregation to meet your needs and to help you work through your problems um, it's not really um, good so for those um, for, with same-sex attraction we can um, overcome sin um, we're sanctified um, God has sanctified us I think that's the interesting thing in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11 he says you were sanctified he's not like you are being sanctified he actually doesn't see sanctification as progressive it's you were sanctified and sanctified means you've been set apart as a holy thing as a dedicated consecrated special thing so they were sanctified and they are being sanctified they're kind of um, two things at, at the same time we're being sanctified and sanctification does take a long time transformation takes a long time difficult choices counterintuitive choices um, but we have the Holy Spirit they're justified you're justified by your faith so even if you've got same-sex attraction and you're like I shouldn't be feeling these things I don't want them doesn't mean that God's not working in your life um, in fact the fact that you know that you've got same-sex attraction that it's wrong I think testifies that the Spirit is working in your life because if you want to give in to them and you want to rebel against God and run away from him and use those desires to reject him I think that sounds worse to me than laboring with them uh, so don't doubt your identity in Christ because you got these feelings um, Uh, if you turn to Christ with faith and repentance you know you do have um, salvation in him um, and as I said you know there, there are ministries that that can that can help you as well like beyond Egypt and Liberty 
Um, firstly, what, what you can do, go to scripture for your inspiration of sex. Um, you know, um, in terms of looking at what good sex looks like, go to the Bible. Um, don't listen to Lady Gaga and Cleo and those publications. Um, you know, if you, do, if you do listen to Lady Gaga, renounce and repent. Um, <laughs> I heard Lady Gaga and I thought she sounds like a mouthwash. Um, <laughs> don't dilute scripture. Um, I think this is true for everyone. Um, yeah, whether you've got same-sex attraction or you love someone who does. Um, I'll, just keep, I'll just go back to this one. Um, it's really important that you stick with what the Bible says. Um, there are so many conflicting messages. I know for um, what I've noticed about older Christians, um, like Christians like my dad's age, is that they tend a lot more to, to do this. Whereas a younger generation, because they tend to be more saturated in what they watch on TV and see on the internet, um, because everything on the internet must be true, um, that they're struggling with what the Bible says. Uh, I think it's really important if you're finding in your in your witness that you're conflicted about what the Bible says on sexuality, it's not, the problem is not the Bible. The problem is never the Bible or never God, it's us. And it's probably something that we've got alongside God's word that we're trying to fuse together or it's something that's in authority over God's word. And you've got to work out what that is and eradicate it. Because otherwise you cannot witness to your gay friends or your same-sex attracted friends because you're going to send them mixed messages and they're going to think, well, what is it? Should I go in the gay lifestyle or not? If you listen to Lady Gaga and that ridiculous song she sings where she says, you know, go do what you want, baby, because that's how you made baby, Chinese, Lebanese, gay or straight, you know, don't let anyone judge you and that, all that sort of nonsense. Well, you're not going to think that scriptures you know, has authority on sexuality. Um, so it's really important that you're really strong in that. Um, and I think sometimes Christian people can compromise their witness on this because if they've got sexual compromise in their own life, or their marriage isn't working out, or they're indulging pornography or something, then they might go soft on their, on their other friends who are dealing with these things and say, well, God forgives, doesn't he? You know? Uh, yeah, God forgives, uh, but the reason that he sanctified people is to make them a holy people like himself. And the Bible, especially 1 Peter chapter 1, be holy for I am holy, kind of says it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, you know, without holiness no one will see the Lord. Holiness is so important, you won't see God without holiness. Matthew, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God. Um, so it's really important that you stick to that. But don't dilute scripture. Um, keep grace and truth in tandem. In John chapter 1 it says Moses came and gave truth, but Jesus came with grace and truth. And it's interesting that grace comes before truth. Jesus isn't all about truth. He is all about truth, but he's not all about truth. Um, it's about grace and truth. And the best example of that in the New Testament is a conversation with the woman in John chapter 4 at the well. How many husbands have you had? Five husbands. I love that conversation because when Jesus mentions the five husbands, she changes the topic. Uh, <laughs> it's just really funny. I, I think it's one of the big ironies of the, of the narrative. But, um, yeah, he, he says to her, oh, you know, um, he says, go call your husband. Oh, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, it is well, you have said I, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And then she says, uh, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Our fathers worship on a mountain. Oh, <laughs> don't want to talk about that one. Um, but it, you know, he doesn't pass judgment on her. Uh, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't reject her. Uh, it's interesting. The time of day she sees him. She comes out of the well in, in midday, so she's obviously avoiding everybody, and she probably thinks that Jesus is going to pick her up. Um, and he does, but he, he does it in a way that she's completely not expecting. Uh, so God uses sexually broken people. Samaria was converted by that woman's testimony. Uh, so it's really important to keep grace and truth together. In the past, the, truth, uh, the, the church used to emphasize truth at the expense of grace. And that's why people go, you're a bunch of homophobic bigots. But some churches are now promoting grace at the expense of truth. Um, people like uh, Rob Bell... Uh, Stephen Chalk, who was an evangelist in the UK, used to be really, really sharp, has now given way on, homose on homosexuality. Um, uh, Brian McLaren, who headed up the Emerging Church Movement, um, married his son in a gay marriage, and this guy is an evangelical leader. 
Um, this, this battleground, or grace and truth, is probably where most of the compromise lies. And sometimes it happens where we go, I've got a friend who's got same-sex attraction, I've got a gay friend, he's such a lovely person, I want him to be happy. But they forget that happiness can only be on God's terms, not our terms. Uh, and they say, I don't want to tell him the truth, I don't want to scare him off. And I think what they're really afraid of is losing the relationship, especially when that person is a son, a daughter, someone that they really care about. And I'm saying to you, I would challenge you, do not, sub do not reject the truth of God's word for the sake of expediency in your relationship. Because what if your son and daughter comes to Christ one day and they turn to you and say, why didn't you faithfully tell me God's word? That would stab your heart more than anything else. And if your kid went to hell, and I don't want to labour this point, but if that loved one, if that loved one or that friend went to hell, and you know in the back of your mind that you could have that you could have had a moment with them where you did faithfully represent God's will for them and you didn't, you have to live with that. And I think that's a really important consideration. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to be so strong on truth that you alienate the person. And I think it's where your own witness of your own life that you're not a perfect person you haven't got it all together but by the grace of god he still loves you and he's still forgiving you and helping you live in righteousness that's the powerful witness because sometimes gay people go you just want to make me a heterosexual like you don't you the answer is no it's not about me it's not about what i would have for your life because i'm you and i aren't god we're imperfect we've got our flaws but by his grace he still loves us and i think if you use that in your testimony that will commend the gospel as much as anything you say about sexuality because it's not about you being better than anybody else and that humble witness I think most of the time is what really gets people I've been on radio twice radio national I've been on television once to give my testimony and I was both interviewed by journalists at the ABC who, are, who both call themselves gay and they both said to me the same thing what commends your testimony it's not necessarily what you say because we disagree with, with, with what you say, it's how you say it. It's how the message is communicated that influenced them more than what I said. And, you know, they're on my Facebook list and, you know, we keep meeting up for coffee and we keep the conversation going. Because it's not so much about what you say as much as how you say it. It's both of them. Um, so we don't want to try and please people with uber grace um, at the expense of truth because that won't witness to anyone, that, sells, that sends people to hell with a smile. But we don't want to send them, you know, we don't want to tell them the truth without grace because then they try to, you know, I've got to do it myself, I've got to make myself, change myself, which just frustrates them. Um, open, up, open up about your own brokenness, as I said. Get educated. So you've got the My Genes website. Another really good one is a man called Rob Gagnon, who is a New Testament scholar from Pittsburgh. Um, he looks like a rabbi with a bow tie, he's really cool. Um, he's excellent because um, he, has, um, he has a struggle with same-sex attraction himself, uh, he's, but he's um, dedicated his website to dealing with sexuality issues. Um, and he's really on the money. So if you're confused about how, how, to, how to answer these issues apologetically, um, I would really recommend his website. Pray. More than anything else, pray because you can't argue people into the kingdom of heaven. I recently did a subject on apologetics and um, one thing I find a little bit troubling about some apologetics is that they think that people can be argued into believing. You can't be argued into believing. The human heart does not have eyes to see. The sinful human heart doesn't have eyes to see. A ch a, the only thing that's going to change a person is a new heart, an experience of God's grace. Um, you might not have flashing lights from the sky like, like, like Paul did, but you have an encounter, a, deep, a deeply personal encounter. Your life can help that. And it might be that your gay friend, relative, um, really doesn't want to hear, they really hate what you have to say. But just keep going. Um, to quote that little fish from Finding Nemo, Dory, um, just keep going, just keep going, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Really, sometimes that's all you can do. And because the sensitivity of the issue might be that you don't have a conversation explicitly about sexuality, um, like Paul Grimman said in that video, sometimes it's just about celebrating a birthday with someone, just sending them a Christmas card, because they've got their defences up and they think that you're going to be a homophobic Christian who's going to shoot them down. So prove them wrong. But don't prove them wrong by having a, a more clever argument. Have, do life together.
Now you've got to be careful about that because there are certain boundaries you don't want to cross, especially when there's children involved. But do life with them. Show them that you care and pray for them. Take an interest in them. If they're in your church and they've got same-sex attraction, take an interest in them, pray for them, but don't treat them like a project. Um, I'll pass it. Talk to the same-sex attracted guy. <laughs> Dan's going to go, his face will go red and go, oh, don't talk to me. Just Can you just email me? <laughs> um, don't make a personal project. Um, I used to hate this. Um, you know, I was at church once and a, a pastor said, oh, Hayden, you should, you should witness to that guy because he's got same-sex attraction. And he said this in, in earshot of the guy who was coming in. And I, I just said, um, yeah, I'll be happy to do that, but only, only if he wants me to. And he might actually want to talk to someone else because he might, he might not be ready to confront that. I can't make him confront it and I, especially if I go up talking to him because we have this similarity, I actually wasn't really comfortable with it. One, because, yeah, I've got this issue but I don't want this to be the issue that defines me either. I, I want to live beyond this issue and I know this issue has been a part of my life but it's not part of my identity and I don't want people viewing me through that lens and doing that to everyone else who's got this struggle. So I just say, you know, take an interest in them, do life together. As Bonhoeffer said, you know, go bowling together, have a meal together. Uh, sometimes you just got to be the loving friend. As I said, you know, you don't want to argue them into changing. You can recommend Liberty Beyond Egypt. Um, yeah, and there's, um, there's other ministries as well. And I'm just going to put up some other resources. There are some books here um, that you can look at. Craving for Love is one of them. That one, I would say, is the Bible on homosexuality and grace. Um, that's such a powerful book. That one, that one really changed me. Um, I cried every 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 chapter I read because uh, it just it, it looks at the deep root at, at the deep root issues, uh, issues of rejection of all sorts of things. What some of you were is another great one published by Matthias Media. I was hoping to update that book when I was working for Liberty. Um, it was written by my predecessor, but that one's got testimonies, and I just love it because it's not Bible and theology; it's testimony. Um, and that's what our world loves, stories. The Father Heart of God, um, it's a short one but a, but a, but a good one um, that looks, uh, I think it's a very good apologetic book on how people can uh, experience God as loving Father. It changes that heal is another good one. Desires in Conflict is excellent. Uh, Joe Dallas, who's got a really good blog and I really suggest you look at his blog and um, really funny guy um, who, who talks a lot about um, homosexuality and Christianity. Uh, he's got a counselling ministry in America and he's excellent. Um, you know, uh, when he's talking about homosexuality, he, do, he does it in very comfortable, easy language. He's very pastoral. Anne Polk, um, Restoring Sexual Identity, is a story of a woman coming out of lesbianism. Um, and Joe Dallas also wrote this one, The Gay Gospel. Uh, that one's excellent because it looks at apologetic issues. Um, so can you be gay and Christian, all that sort of stuff. So those are some things that you can look at if you want to.